Oh, I'm going to say this up front. There's a lot of information here and I'm going to be going through quickly. Um, I have a lot of text up on the screen in certain slides. I'm not going to be reading, so read along. And um, I may not get to questions, but I'll be available for them at the end. So that's what we're going for. Um, so I'm the head of the archives at UHCL. Um, it's just down the road. We're on the backside of JSC. And if you don't know about us, we collect, arrange, describe, preserve, and make available uh, publicly accessible original historical archival materials uh, for use by our constituents for research and preservation of community history. So who are our communities? Our university archives, we were founded in 1989 as in university archives. Um, our Clear Lake area collection that we document for this region, uh, including the building of Clear Lake City in 1962 for NASA. And we serve as the custodian for the 3,000 linear feet plus JSC history collection since 2001 on a Space Act agreement. And then we also have our own human space flight collection from former JSC personnel. And that's our reading room, if you come to use it. So the archival records that document human space flight history and the history of NASA are composed of a complex mixture of issues related to unique and difficult formats to preserve, numerous duplicates and non-original materials that American society is convinced are worth preserving. Uh, NASA personnel and NASA contractors were widely known for duplicating, sharing, and throwing away original human spaceflight program records. The duplication and multiple versioning of the records uh, for things like the Apollo program development makes it difficult for archives to identify which records are most worth collecting and preserving. NASA's own cultural heritage um, emphasize what was important to keep and collect is what I call uh, growing up in Northeast Ohio and going to Cleveland and Dayton air shows, air show collectibles. Um, signed, so nothing against Mr. Perlman um, or any other collector, but from an archives perspective, this stuff is not unique for us. Uh, signed astronaut photographs, mission patches, matchbooks. I got so many patches, I can't even tell you. Um, mission emblem stickers, collectible NASA posters, NASA equipment, pieces of flight vehicles, like an L-shaped piece from a full-size NASA shuttle um, that went over the bathroom that we were offered last year. Um, and uh, other common three-dimensional artifacts that are given or sold out at American air shows. Such items, like awards and certificates, were seen by NASA personnel as more important to preserve than their original historical records of actual air and space uh, programs in many cases. So for us, separating the original archival records that have enduring historical value out from common or collectible NASA materials is a challenge for any archives that holds the records of former NASA personnel. The consequences of not establishing a focused collecting policy can lead an archives in, uh, to taking in significant amount of non-unique materials that will waste uh, what uh, NASA is known for, space. Um, this can lead ar archives to being unable to accept more significant collections of original human spaceflight records from actual missions, programs, and research projects when potential donations become available. So the purpose of this talk is a, a case study in how UHCR uh, archives handled it when I started back in 2022 and how we changed that. So we're going to go through some of the boring stuff. Um, we've had um, NASA records since 2001 when we became a custodian of the JSC History Collection on a renewable loan from NASA and the National Archives. And you, here you can see our President William Staples, bottom left, signing the Space Act Agreement. Um, our partnership with, this, uh, with JSC resulted in us having former JSC personnel bringing us their papers. And so we built our own human spaceflight collection uh, that is separate from the federal collection. Uh, we own it. Um, it's focused on collecting the records of former JSC personnel and contractors to help document the history of JSC within the Bay Area of Texas. And now the HSF collection is one of the largest human spaceflight collections outside of federal agency archives in the United States. It's over 105 separate archival collections as of right now, a totaling at least 950 linear feet. We think it's closer to 1,400, a little hard to tell. So I'm gonna go through a few of the names. Uh, some of you have talked about, some of you have said you couldn't find these records. Well, we have them, so come and check them out. Uh, Maxime Faget, we have all of his papers. Carolyn Connolly, we just finished her collection uh, for first female uh, flight activities officer. Uh, Norman Chafee, Alan DuPont, uh, Denny Holt, Paul Horseman, Glenn Lunny's papers. Um, let's see, Shelby Owens, Don Putty, Leo Rytan, we have John Kiker, Joseph Thibodeau, 
uh, Floyd Bennett, um, we have Bilstein. Bilstein was a UHCL professor. We have four of his collections, um, including the, his two research projects for his books. Uh, Rod Rose's papers, you name it, we've got it. So when I started in March 2022, we had an informal collection policy. And this is gonna be helpful for all of you from museums or heritage places that get offered this stuff. So hopefully uh, this is beneficial. Um, it was less than two pages long. And if you know anything about professional collection policies for archives and museums, that is not sufficient to tell people I can't take this in because we have this in our collection policy. As of 2016, our collection policy was one third of a page long and you see that here on the slide. Um, it didn't list specific archival formats or content requirements that we'd accept, so we got a lot of non-original stuff. And the pre-2022 collecting approach led us to get over 300 linear feet of duplicate human spaceflight materials. I was hired to clean this practice up <laughs> and create a new collection policy. So spring of 2022, we started running out of storage space. We had to be smarter with our, how we managed our collections and how we acquired them and maximize the limited expansion space we had for future collections. And over a two year period up through this month, um, we've implemented a plan to gain back over 600 linear feet of shelf space in our two storage rooms. And what has happened as a result is we weeded out uh, from existing collections, but things that we decided we didn't need or had duplicates of, and we deaccessioned over 250 linear feet of non-unique materials. Uh, we've done better shelf management. We've reboxed materials from odd-shaped or oversized containers that uh, donors brought them in, um, so it was wasting space on the shelves. And we reorganized our collections to maximize our space. Um, and uh, we were able to bring 250 linear feet of records um, in since then um, and from off-site storage as a result. And what happens when you get rid of all these boxes is um, you unleash a box monster. Th that's me, by the way. Um, so after UHCR archives received the JC History Collection, um, like I said, former, current former personnel started bringing their papers in, but they also brought their books primarily. And we really didn't get started getting archival collections until 2006. So four years we were getting a lot of books. Um, and inconsistencies in our collecting focus from 2002 to 2021 meant we were missing significant personal work records. It's so like we have Aaron Cohen's papers, but it's a few boxes and it's mostly his presentations and papers. It's not his actual decision-making stuff, his personal letters from work. That stuff's in the, uh, the JSC History Collection or at the National Archives and then everything else is gone. Um, but he had that stuff and we could have asked him for it at the time. So that's the difference. So we had to change our focus, uh, narrow our collecting focus to improve. So we created a more purposeful collection policy in March of 2022. Um, it, the new policy assisted us in controlling uh, the quality of the research materials we were getting in and gave us a basis for reviewing collections we had already accessioned. After reviewing our holdings, talking with former NASA personnel and engineers and working with researchers, we learned what information is most in demand and then we started looking as we were bringing in donations of where, how that information was recorded. And that led us to create a general collecting approach to limit the formats that we were focused on acquiring. And this is our own uh, approach. From 1950s to 2000s, NASA and NASA contractors produced developmental information for space programs and projects in about 10 specific records formats. And by this I don't mean like a 16 millimeter film or a daguerreotype photograph. I mean format categories specific to human spaceflight working records. And we'll talk about that in a little more detail. Um, these formats were not retained by NASA administration. They're archive centers in most of cases. NASA contractors, Boeing Houston has told us they threw all their stuff out uh, after Apollo uh, just down the road. And, uh, or the National Archives, which keeps official records. Uh, lack of retention has led to a huge informational loss related to decision-making information at the unit, branch, and division level at JSC. And we hear this a lot from former NASA employees. So this is what picking up collections are like from uh, deceased NASA engineers um, it, it, in 105 degree temperatures in a garage, um, in an attic a storage closet space that has no air circulation, and a storage unit that says it had air conditioning, but um, we sweated three pounds off in that one day. So what don't we collect is a lot easier to tell people. And we, for, for that, we use NASA uh, Headquarters Archive's own 
guide of what they don't collect. Artifacts, artwork, like framed big pieces, autographs, commercial published books or magazines, newspapers, contractor promotional materials, models, programs of events in which NASA didn't officially participate or sponsor, publicly created scrapbooks, newspaper clippings, and space memorabilia, patches, pins, coins, medallions, etc. Like this um, rocket desk piece that we got given to us. Um, and that's almost, that's a lot of what we were being offered when I started. So things like HR and general workplace announcements, we don't need those, those are recorded other places. General NASA glossaries and copy preparation manuals. We have those in our reference book collection. We don't need more, those are available. Public affairs and promotion materials. Press kit, we get so many of these, we don't need these. Uh, they're available in other places, a lot of them are online. Children's materials and books. Coloring book, guide to the Soviet space. We don't need this, they're not gonna be able to color this book in. What can we do with it? And newspapers, the amount of historic newspapers we've been offered or had to pitch away from the Houston Chronicle and Houston Post for all Apollo stuff is crazy. It's on microfilm, they've been digitized, we don't need to keep this. So what do we collect? Well, these are the general categories we've come up with. Um, personal and meetings notebooks, correspondence and memoranda, records of individuals' work history and experience, uh, research records and notes, internally produced NASA Center technical publications uh, specific to JSC, large format drawings and maps, personalized common materials, self-created work materials, audiovisual materials, and unique ephemera and miscellaneous materials. And we'll run through samples of these items for you to see. Uh, personal meeting notebooks contain work notes, engineering development thoughts, meeting notes and decisions, and miscellaneous information. There are two types that we run across. The famous Federal Supply Service uh, green fabric notebooks on the left, and the standard spiral bound subject notebooks. Uh, the green fabric notebooks were used by the, supplied to the U.S. Armed Forces since the 50s, and then all federal agencies started using these. But you don't see these in most other federal agencies as much as you do with NASA. And NASA engineers liked the notebooks, so they took most of their meeting notes in these. Um, individuals used markers and colored pens to customize the covers, as you see here, uh, from Lisa Leonard Moore for her KU band uh, work adding their names and dates of usage, as well as some cases of the specific program or work for which the notebook was utilized. Or you get stuff like this from Richard Nygren, uh, the former chief of NASA JSC's vehicle integration test team, the VIT team, that was responsible for transporting the shuttle program mission astronauts from JSC to the launch pad at uh, KSC. From 1967 to 2001, he kept 49 dated uh, green fabric notebooks that for the shuttle program detail every meeting, dinner, and breakfast with the shuttle astronaut crew and information about the launches. It's uh, one of these notebooks have his unique perspective. It's one of a kind. It's a complete record from STS-1 to STS-102. And you can see a note um, asking if they need to come up with an STS-27 debriefing plan considering the secure aspects, which they mean the DOD satellite deployment. And then notebooks like this, we get a lot of these. They started transitioning these more in the 80s, so. Correspondence and memoranda. Um, almost all former JSC personnel have no personal correspondence saved as part of their papers. And I'm talking like, you're a World War II vet, you write home to your loved ones, that's personal correspondence. Uh, you're a women's rights advocate in 1910s, you write letters, that's your personal correspondence. They, they don't keep that. They never did. Um, or they separated it and then threw it away. So getting their personal perspectives is really difficult. Um, we do get some things like for certain people, Glenn Lunny received numerous correspondence for people in his hometown and state of Pennsylvania congratulating and asking questions following the successful return of the Apollo 13 astronauts. But most correspondence in former JC's personnel is official among NASA units, contractors, and consultants. Memoranda or memos are the most single most requested archival format from researchers that we get because they're cited in official NASA publications and reports. And they're often cited at, from the lower levels in the branch section and project teams and no one preserved them. Right now we're working with a NASA Langley on a project that's very influ influential for Artemis and they can't find the research because it's at a lower memo level. Uh, they found all the available memos we have and even the people who worked on it who are listed as being the people working on it 
keep, can't remember that they worked on it and keep telling the, this uh, engineer we work with to go to another place. Let's see. To, um, another person or another place, and that person or place tells them to go back to the same person or place because they can't remember. So. Um, it is unclear if there was ever a NASA center policy on collecting or maintaining official memos below the senior leadership level, but it comes in that, like I said, most of these have significant issues to solve with equipment and vehicles, internal debate about technical developments, and suggestions of solutions for difficulties um, that were at the lower levels at NASA centers. Um, at JSC in the 60s and 70s, each division branch of a division and each unit or project team within a branch had their own memos circulating, primarily within their working group like this author's copy from Rocky Duncan. Or handwritten memos like you see from Paul Horseman on the right that weren't printed or typed up or didn't have a number assigned to them. These branch memos only exist within personal work collections if they save the memos and they're not complete when we get them. We only get a few here and there occasionally. Um, yeah. Records of, in, oh, so, and letters like this from Glenn Lunny, um, to Glenn Lunny from Ron Howard, thanking him for his role in advising on Apollo 13 film. Individuals of, uh, individuals work history and experience records. Uh, this includes their resumes, personnel files, promotion job titles, like you see on the left here. Um, other records documenting some chronological fashion of their career arcs. NASA engineers and scientists are some of the hardest people for a public historian to write biographies regarding, as they frequently do not retain or generate personal materials like letters and photographs that we would use to generate that stuff. We frequently get no bio information from them or in their papers and are lucky to find or receive a, a resume that traces their professional job titles, especially when they change jobs six times in a year at JSC. Drives us nuts. Um, and archives needs this information to help with the arrangement and description of an individual's records to place the materials within given programs when they're undated but they have a title of projects and their work position responsibilities. Often we don't know anything about engineers before they earn their bachelor or master's degrees, including where they were born and raised, who their parents were, or where, what they were interested in before college. It's like they came birthed as engineers. Um, Due to federal law, former NASA employees' personnel records cannot be accessed by the public after 1951, as those records are managed as active records at the Civilian Personnel Records Center in Illinois. So it's important that we receive, and archives receives a cop, original or copy of their for, uh, personnel files, which they are allowed to give us because it's their files. Um, personnel files are also some of the key means of documenting sexism and illegal HR practices within JSC for female personnel as male managers and evaluation, male managers evaluations and comments and records of complaints and harassment are only retained in retired female uh, employees personnel records like Carol Holman's personnel file here that we are finishing the paperwork on right now. As an example, Dr. Marion Dyson, one of the first five female flight activities officers in NASA's history, whose personnel file is one of the only public records related to a discrimination complaint filed in the spring of 1982 by three female flight activity officers at JSC. Their complaint states that they were removed from lead FAO assignments just after STS-3 mission in March 1982 and prior to the STS-4 mission, replaced by men who had far fewer years experience for the positions. And without such files, the discrimination plate would never be uncovered for the public to discover. And here's other examples, like Maxime Faget's Facebook, which we've termed the Facebook, um, which is from 1966. It's photos with the rank title and the department uh, unit branch of every single NASA engineer or personnel member. Um, yeah. So we can see how many women, like at right, are in a given group. In this case, there are only two photos of women in this Facebook from 1966. There's only one minority member's photo on here. That's how it goes. Research records, um, let me speed this up. For uh, JSC branch or division chiefs, these records are found in the form of research files, um, subject files that they kept in their filing cabinets, like these from Charles Yadzis, who was the chief of the primary propulsion branch from 1964 through his retirement. A large portion of his papers consisted of materials he stored in his office uh, in subject and research files by project purpose, engine type, and mission names. And it has his original handwritten scientific calculation notes in the files. Internally produced NASA technical publications. Project training manuals, handbooks, uh, checklists, binders, and other loose page publications used by engineers, flight directors, etc. 
Um, specific to JSC, we uh, primarily focus on collecting these as they're less likely to have been shared outside of JSC. Many of these publications were used for actual missions. Each branch and division created their own version of these publications, and individual JSC employees added their own notes and modifications, so we don't know what's different unless we have them all. Uh, often, there are only several copies of a particular handbook or checklist if generated within a given branch. Um, and here's JSC's technical uh, publications library that was shut down in the, between the 1990s and 2000s, and we ended up at our library getting their government, a lot of their government docs and uh, publications in our general book collection. The rest were thrown away. Yeah, this was the only central place to get these reports for years. Or you get things like Robert Hessemau, the Telmu engineer for a, a lunar module for Apollo 13, who volunteers with us. Um, and this is his original fly, you know, flight mission rules book that had his original notes on the power-up needed to have the lunar module serve as a lifeboat. There's a famous New York Times article, or New, York, um, New Yorker magazine article from 1972 quoting him in his role. Large format drawings and maps. Um, we focus on collecting these if they have handwritten or handwritten colored notations like these from the ALT uh, tests. Uh, from Chuck Datrick, uh, who was the flight dynamics officer on the all orbiter test flights. There were only eight to ten people at those flights that we understand from him. And these are his original charts for all the test flights uh, with his handwritten notes, uh, paths, everything on them. We don't take in duplicate lunar orbit charts like Mercator projection lunar maps. There's tons of them. Personalized common materials we collect, like Glenn Lunny's uh, photo notebooks for different missions. Um, a lot of people got these, but we learned from a, a photo person at JSC that each person could ask for specific photos in their books, so no two are the same. Or these schedules, where the person has different meetings or notes um, that you're not gonna find, any, or when meetings were canceled or changed for various reasons. Uh, Self-created works like Rocky Duncan's flight safety panel meetings minutes uh, after the Apollo 1 fire. Um, this is the type transcript at left and then the handwritten transcript for a different meeting at right where you have people's names who weren't able to show up, uh, comments that were crossed out but you can still read. Um, and this is the only copy we know of that exists. So I'm going to run out of time, but I'll skip through this. So photos are really important for us. We do collect these, but one of the important things to know about photographs is after 1964, um, JSC issued a memo stating that um, all personnel should have all photographs taken on base, printed by the JSC photo lab, and including photos taken with their own personal cameras. And then a lot of employees start using the lab to print their own personal cameras off-site, like the one at right from a marathon in downtown Houston by a former NASA engineer. Um, and you can tell it's blown up, it's kind of pixelated because it was taken with a smaller personal camera and then printed to JSC paper size. So just because the photo is on JSC paper doesn't mean it's a JSC photo. <laughs> That's the thing that a lot of researchers get confused. Just because it has a number doesn't mean there's a corresponding negative, because by the 80s, they started returning the negatives to the people and not keeping them because they were running out of space. So don't get rid of those photos, because you think that they're at JSC. We have talked to them. They're not. Um, or prototype space to test photos that aren't available anywhere else. Or photos like this for Maxime Faget. Chet Huntley interviewed him in 1965. The interview never aired. We have a memo about why it happened, but there are six photographs showing the interview happening, and these are the only records of this. Or computer graphic analysis images from Dr. David Pitts's uh, visual data analysis subteam for uh, the Challenger accident. These are original computer generated photos that are his personal copies. He was a UHCL professor, so we got these. Or Mars moon habitation computer generated photos that weren't saved, but show cool visual things. Or films. Films and audio are the hardest because they get duplicated a lot. A lot of times they're not labeled properly. We can't tell if they're original and they cost a lot to digitize. The one at left, we wouldn't digitize. The one at right is a computer generated lunar landing film between 1966 and 1969, so we would digitize that, but JSC, con NASA controls audiovisual recordings being made available, so we have to get a grant to get them digitized, but we can't make them available publicly, so we can't get the grant to get them digitized. 
or audio stuff, so I'm running tight, but I'm gonna play this. Um, audio visual materials, like I said, we get a lot of duplicates, but uh, this one is an internal recording uh, between um, um, t um, flight controllers from Robert Grilly, who was a t um, contractor, but was in charge of communication for the Skylab 4 missions. And you can hear, JSC does not have these. Can you hear the background, the duplication? You hear all the other channels going on. And I'm not gonna be able to play the argument that I was gonna play for you, but there's an argument between people fighting over stuff. JSC didn't pre uh, pre preserve internal communication recordings. Or things like this for Unique Ephemera. Um, uh, uh, before he became a, a scientist, his personal drawings. So I'm gonna to skip to pass this. So security concerns. The biggest hurdle for us collecting materials uh, going into the future is the tightening landscape and redefinition of security concerns of NASA historical records. Our collections used to be made publicly available since the 90s, but now uh, in November 2023, with recent federal issues with records, classified records and security concerns, the RJSC history collection is marked as controlled unclassified information and under federal export controls. We can't make these things available to non-US citizens. We can't digitize them and send them anywhere. We can only provide access to them in-house, which is a huge change from how we used to be. We used to be able to provide stuff overseas at JSC's own request, but now it's run by NASA headquarters. Um, we cannot, haven't been able to provide access since November to anybody other than NASA employees or contractors. And these security changes will influence whether we collect records that may have higher level restricted content in the future. It's also forcing us to label all of our human space collections as closed to not as citizens, which makes it hard for us at a school with a high international student uh, body that has a lot of um, engineering students who are from other countries. We can't, how do we tell half a class you can't access this stuff? And um, digital records are now highly secured. Employees can't take these off site. So going forward, we're not gonna be able to collect any records past the 2010s. Um, so our collection, our human space flight collection, will end at that point. And that's our LibGuides page you can find online, and that's my contact information. Thank you very much. Sorry I didn't get to finish that.